Well, Merry Christmas. I, I love that new sermon series branding. This series is called Light and Easy, and I'm really excited to start it with you today. Uh, Jesus gives us an invitation, doesn't he? Gives us an invitation here. I'm going to talk about that for just a minute, but I do need to give you one commercial. The commercial is we are almost completely sold out of Christmas Eve. Our Christmas Eve services are almost completely full. I think there's 50 tickets left for the 130 show. Other than that, it's completely sold out. That's good news, except if you didn't get your tickets yet. So um, we just want you to know that we've opened up a waiting list on those services, those Christmas Eve services. And if you'll just, if you haven't got your tickets yet, if you'll just go ahead and get your name on the waiting list, that would be great because that'll let us know where the demand is. We're going to be meeting together this week. I don't want to freak out the staff because we haven't talked about it yet, but we're going to meet this week and try to discover how we can provide uh, some more space for people to come and be a part of that. So it will help us if you go ahead. If you haven't got your tickets yet, just go ahead and put your your, uh, need on the waiting list. That'll really help us to know what we need to do uh, to, to prepare. These are good problems, right? Really good problems. That's really fun. I mean, we have 3,000 seats that are gone already, so that's just wonderful. We're so excited about that. Okay, now to the message. Light and easy. And this whole message series is based, uh, it's kind of foundationed by this verse that was uh, part of the sermon branding and bumper there, and it's from Matthew 11. And it's where Jesus speaks an invitation to us to come and to make it light and easy, to, to yoke your to him. We know the Christian life is a challenge. We know that life itself is a challenge. But, but Jesus' invitation is rich and blessed, and it's for us. I want us to read it together. It's from Matthew 11, 28 to 30, and it says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Jesus is saying, hey, if it's heavy, come see me, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, which means to, to be connected to me, side by side, that we might work together and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. So not just rest, as it says earlier, but rest in the soul. We talked a little bit about the soul rest that God gives us last week. And now here's, here's sort of the key part of the verse for us. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Light and easy. Light and easy. And I think that this is a theme, not just for our sermon series, but for your life this Christmas season. I think it's, a, it's definitely something for us as a family. We've talked about this. My children love it. I told them it's going to be light and easy. It's going to be light on presents and easy on the parents. Amen? <laughs> Anybody with me? Light and easy. Easy. Let's go light and easy this year. And I do think that there's something spiritual about this where we can actually miss the joy of the season. We can miss the blessing and the benefit of kind of anticipation toward arrival when we celebrate Jesus if we allow things to get heavy and burdened because that's the other part of this, right? Jesus said, if you're heavy and burdened, come and get light and easy. That's a good invitation, yeah? Yeah. And so that's kind of foundational for this message and for the series. This message particularly, I think it has the potential to impact your life maybe as much or more as any messages we've preached yet this year because what we want to do is we want to learn how to join Jesus in his invitation, how to take him up on his invitation because there is a burden, there is a heaviness about life and Jesus invites us into what is light and easy and this is a great message especially at Christmas time as we all prepare to spend too much right? We all prepare to spend too much. So let's talk a little bit about how to keep it light and easy. Let me remind you, Christian, I know that may not be your name, but it is your identity, Christian. Let me remind you, Christian, this world is not your home. Can I have an amen in the house? This world is not your home. And as life goes on, we have a tendency to accumulate, don't we? We accumulate. We accumulate distractions, We accumulate hurts, 
We accumulate disappointments, but Jesus invites us in to light and easy. And in order for us to take him up on his invitation, we have to let go of some things. And that's what this series is all about. Getting rid of heavy and burdened and picking up the light and easy of Jesus. We're going to let go of distractions. We'll talk about that in this series. We're going to talk about letting go of control. And some of you are going to want to stay home because you're control freaks. You won't want to come to church that Sunday. We're going to talk about letting go of control. We're going to talk about letting go of the failures of the past. We're going to talk about all of these things together, but today we're going to focus on letting go of stuff, letting go of stuff, the stuff that weighs us down, the stuff that can make us heavy rather than light and easy. So I want to share a quote with you, and I think you'll be able to agree with it. If you agree with it, you can say amen. I'll read it twice. We'll say it twice because you might not get it at first, but here it is. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. I thank you for that, amen. I'll say it again so the rest of you can join us because it's really true. <laughs> it's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. Amen. amen. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? The problem is our culture screams at us something else. Screams at us actually the opposite of this. You need more. You need extra. You need better. You need new. And this reflects one of the first lies that was ever told to humanity. If we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and we arrive with Adam and Eve in the garden, it's perfect, it's beautiful, and they are well-fed, well-cared for, um, it's in every way, it's blessed, they're with God, they're enjoying paradise. God says you can eat of all these trees, any of the trees except this one because it's just, it has a purpose, but it's not for you. And in the storyline, we see the serpent entering. And when the serpent enters, he begins to seed, planting a lie. And he says, did God really say not to eat from any tree in the garden? You see, God said you can have them all, but not this one. But the enemy plants a lie. And the lie is this. What you don't have is what you need. What you don't have is what you need. And the world continues to perpetuate this lie. We do it to ourselves that if I really want to be happy and if I really want to be fulfilled, if I really want to be complete, then the thing that I don't have is what I need. And most of us grew up thinking that more is always better. I think that my last name is Moore. More is always better. Friends, it's an old joke, but I only got what I got, okay? So, you know, I grew up the youngest of four boys, and more was always better. More mashed potatoes, more gravy, more of mama's fried chicken. I'm from the South. Amen. Always more. We used to eat with our hands around our plates and our forks up, not so that we could eat, but so that we could defend ourselves from our brothers. Youngest of four boys, more is always better. And you know, I grew up thinking that, and maybe you did too. Most of us in our culture do that. If one dollar is good, two dollars is better. If one car is good, two cars are better. If one vacation is good, two, car, two vacations is better. If one kid is good, honey, four is enough. <laughs> Amen? We're one. We're in agreement. And where there is unity, the Lord commands a blessing. No more children. But you know, it is natural. Think about kids, right? You know, when, when, uh, when I was growing up with my brothers, they would always say this, I'd be, I'd be, it's always about food, you know, hungry, okay? I'd be eating something and my brother would say, can I have a bite? You know what that means? That means, can I have the rest? Because for some reason, my brothers had this, uh, this ability to throw their heads right back and their mouths would open about this big. And then they would chop down and eat your hand as well. You have to pull it back. So you never share I want a bite. That means I want it all. And when you cut something in half, you're eyeing it up. Which one's the larger half? Come on, somebody. That's human nature right there. I want the more. I want more than you. That's what I want. But here's what I've learned as I've aged, as I've gotten a few gray hairs, and as I have, you know, I have more than I once did. What I've learned is the truth is more is simply more. That's all. It's just more. And in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, more is just more to manage. It's more to think about. It's more to sift through. It's more to store. It's just more. That's all. It's just more. In fact, 
I think we're going to find our footing today. We're going to look back into the Old Testament to one of the wisest people who ever lived on the planet, King Solomon. And King Solomon said something so incredible. This is going to guide us today. He said, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. He says, better is one than two. He's saying better is less than more. What he's reflecting on here, and in other words, what he's saying is let's have less of what doesn't matter so that we can have more of what does. And so he continues to reinforce our thoughts today. And why is this important? It's important because your life is so valuable. In fact, I would say it this way. It's too valuable. And you're calling too great for you to waste your life on things that don't matter. And the enemy would love to help you do that, but we're not going to allow that. In fact, there's a story where Jesus speaks into this exact same thing. It's a story in the New Testament in Luke chapter 12. And in this story, two brothers are arguing about the inheritance and they speak up to Jesus. They actually interrupt the meeting Jesus was conducting. And one of them says, Jesus, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, listen, that's not my, my dispute. You guys sort out your you know, worldly wealth. And then he makes this statement. This is a great warning for all of us. He says, watch out. I mean, Jesus is drawing attention here. Even in the Bible, there's an exclamation point. And then he says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And then he says, this, this is the most liberating and freeing thing that we can keep in mind about our financial life, about our spending habits, about our accumulation. He says this, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Are you seeing that today? Are you hearing what Jesus is saying my life does not consist of my stuff. I'm not what I have or what I own or what I drive or what I wear. That's what Jesus is saying, but the problem is our culture shouts the opposite. You know, it, you are what you have, what you own, what you drive, and what you wear. And again, it's that deep-rooted first lie of the enemy. What you don't have is actually what you need. And so you always feel conflicted and undone and as though there's some other material thing that would finally bring satisfaction. And you look at someone else's life and you look at the opportunity to buy something like what they have and you can say, oh, if I had that, I'd be happy. I'd be popular. I'd be cool. I'd be hip. I'd start to fit in. I'd finally measure up. But friends, it's a lie. And here's a question for you. What if the stuff you have is robbing you of the life you want? Is that possible? Is it possible that the pursuit of stuff is actually robbing us from the pure joy of the life that we actually want? Because when you step back and you think about the things that really matter to you, you might start with a big house and a big car and a vacation home and, you know, a trip around the world and five-star hotels. No, let's go seven-star hotels. But when you really boil it down, it's about people. It's about loved ones. It's about belonging. It's about, it's about purpose. And none of those things offer that. And so that's why I think it's so important for us to recognize that our stuff can actually rob us of the life that we want. Why am I telling this to you? It's Christmas time. Come on, where's baby Jesus? We're gonna get there. Not today. <laughs> You're 22 days away from Christmas and some of you have your worst, worst possible decisions to make ahead of you. How much am I going to spend? And so what we want to do is we want to realize, we just want to kind of come out from the facade for a moment as a family, as a church family, and say we know that every commercial, every ad, every post, every message is going to say you need two handfuls. In fact, the one handful that you have is the wrong one. You need two new handfuls. That's what our world is going to tell us. But I want to to help you today, as I'm helping myself, I'm, I'm preaching to myself today. And I want us to learn how to practice one handful living. 
There's some joy in it. It's better. That's what Solomon said. It's better. That's what your Bible says. It's better to live one handful life. And I'm going to tell you kind of how to do that. Okay, so the first one is this. If you want to live a one handful life where you are living that better life, number one, start by throwing out. Throw out. You've got stuff to throw out. You've got to get rid of some things. Move things along as if your life depends on it because it actually does. Isn't that what the Bible just taught us? That your life does not consist in the abundance of things? And the truth is some of us have lost our lives in the pursuit of things. So get rid of stuff as though your life depends on it. I'm not saying you should declutter. I'm saying you should de-own. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Um, I love this quote. I'm going to share it with you, and then we'll, we'll just kind of reflect on it for a moment. Here it is. Owning less is way better than organizing more. Hey, isn't that cool? What a thought. Owning less is way better than organizing more. It is way better than organizing more. Did you know, I've forgotten the stat now, but I just recently came across a stat that said how many people have a house with a garage that is so full that they also have to rent a storage uh, building just to keep their stuff. Conviction falls over the house. (laughs) It can happen to us. And Jesus actually addresses this idea in uh, one particular place where there's this, uh, in Matthew 19, there's this rich young ruler who comes to him, this, this handsome young man who has it all. He has wealth, he has prominence, he has an entourage, and he shows up and he talks to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I'm interested because I have it all and I still feel like I need something. I want to understand life. I want to understand eternal life. What do I have to do in order to have eternal life? And so Jesus lists all the the normal things, you know, do the commandments, love God, love your neighbor, and and you'll be good. And he says, I've done all that. In other words, I still know there's something else here. It's not about the doing. Something's going on in here. Jesus, I see you. I see you have nothing that I have, and yet you seem so different. How do I have eternal life? And Jesus looks at him, the Bible says, in a loving way, looks at him and says, listen, you have too much stuff. You're stuck in your stuff. He says, sell your stuff, give to the poor, and then gives him the greatest invitation to physically join him in his mission, to walk with Jesus, to be in the inner circle, to sit around the fire, to hear and understand Jesus' teaching. He says, follow me, which is not something he said to everyone. He says, follow me, and you'll have treasures in heaven. What he's saying is exactly what we've been talking about. Let go of what doesn't matter so that you can have more of what does. But here's the response of the young man. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. You see, you never know what idols you have until Jesus points them out to you. And let me just be very clear here. This is important. It's not wrong to have stuff. It's never wrong to have things. Some of you have nice things. Enjoy them. God has blessed you. Enjoy them. It's okay to have things. The problem is, and when it becomes wrong, is when those things have you. When they become your identity. When you've lost yourself to them. When the pursuit and the maintenance of them is what you worry about. Something has happened. And this is what we're looking into today. That when they start, these things start to distract you from what matters, you got to throw them out. You got to get rid of them. And I'm not saying be wasteful, but move them along. Move them into somebody else's need versus your accumulation. Your second handful is what causes toil and a chasing after the wind. That's what the Bible says. So here's two reasons why people hold on to stuff. Are you ready for this? You know, I'm talking about knickknacks, cute little things, dishes. Does anybody have a VHS collection? (laughs) Old Atari games. Nintendo 64, okay. Um, Pants that you haven't worn since high school. (laughs) How's your junk drawer looking today, right? There's two reasons why we hold on to stuff. Number one is fear. And number two is sentiment. Number one is fear. It's a scarcity mindset that says, no, 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 I might need this. Uh, Okay, here's the real deal. Some of you are holding on to stuff because you think your kids might want it. (laughs) They don't want it. (laughs) 
They don't want it. I'm telling you right now, if they're gonna if they're gonna get one, it's not the color you have, it's not the shape you have, it's not the way you have it. They want their own and they want it different. They're not gonna want it. Someone just got free in Jesus' name. You just were liberated. Right there. You came to church and you're 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 a new creation. The Lord just set you free. That was beautiful. They, they don't want it. Some of us, it's a fear of not wanting to waste. And I appreciate that, right? Like, we need to recycle. We need to reuse. We need to watch what we do. I'm not saying just throw it in the landfill, but I'm saying that you don't need it, so get rid of it. Send it out somewhere else. Let it be a, a, a blessing to someone else. So it's fear. It's also sentiment. It's like, oh, this is so precious. This was a gift from my dead grandmother. Can I just, can I pick on you a minute, Lisa? My, my wife, Lisa, has this walking doll. And it is the creepiest thing in the world. We literally use it to scare people. Well, it, it, like, it has gross hair. And it, it's like, you, I, do you hold its hands? And then it goes like, like this. <laughs> It has like kind of realish looking eyes. It's from the 70s, has a really bad mullet. It's Maddie. But we'll like put it in bed and cover it up with, with the blankets and then someone will come in and ah, you know, and I'll go into the back storage and it's turned around. And I'm like, why is it turned around? And Zach said, it keeps looking at me. It's creepy. <laughs> you know, we hold on to stuff because it was precious to her when she was little, right? Tommy's first ribbon. You know, the hair, the first little curl you cut off of their hair. How sweet, how precious. Some of you are collecting teeth. That is gross. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> right? Throw it out. Sentiment or fear. It's quite interesting, hey? You know, a huge part of throwing things out is simply this. It requires that we're saying to God, God, I trust you for what I need, right? Part of the accumulation is that fear that I'm not going to have something. And, and, and that can lead us into a bad and fearful place. But when we throw it out, when we let it go, we're saying, God, we trust you. Well, yeah, but what if mine breaks? Then I have a reserve. Well, good for you. Can't God help you? Can't, can you trust God that he can give you what you need, that you could give that extra one away to bless somebody else? Does it make good sense to you? It, certainly it does. We kind of have this uh, policy, Lisa and I, about getting one and giving one. If we get something new, we don't really wear our stuff out anymore. Like our kids, you know, we're like, you need new shoes. Your feet are wet, right? Because they're leaking now through the bottom. You've worn them out. But for us as adults, things seem to last longer. And so we have to kind of say, when we get something, we give something else away. We're only going to keep this much. We only have this much room in our closet. We haven't expanded our closet. We just have to keep it this size. We got a move it out. If we haven't used it in a year, move it out. Um, uh, I'm going to get Marie Kondo on you for just a minute. Does anybody know Marie Kondo? She wrote a book. What a title. Are you ready for it? The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. She's a professional organizer. If you go look her up on, um, on Wikipedia, she's a professional organizer. That seems like a, a pretty interesting job. She's a Japanese lady. She wrote a book. And um, uh, I, I didn't read the book. I, I listened to the audio book while I was doing other things. And it's kind of interesting. The concept is, is quite fun. Okay, so what you do is you hold up an item that you have. You can do this at home. It'll be fun. And you ask yourself, does it spark joy? We're just saying joy to the world, right? Does this, does this old sweater spark joy? And if it doesn't, you hold it close, you thank it for what it has done for you, and you let it go, right? Don't do that with your spouse or your children. 
but you can do that with your old sweater, okay? There are things that we can move along, things that can move along. We can Marie Kondo a few things. We can get rid of them. We can say, thank you. You've served your purpose, and now you're out the door. We're on to other things. And the truth is what we're saying is we don't want to let our stuff crowd out what matters most, right? We don't want to be walking around the piles of stuff and our soul, the same, is crowded because it's better to have one handful with tranquility than two with toil and a chasing after the wind. Amen? Second thing, buy less. How do we do one handful living? We buy less. How many of you have ever been to the store and you've just said, oh man, that's so, that is so cheap. It's too good to pass it up. It's 50% off. You know what? The salesperson will tell you, man, this is the sale of the year. You need to buy this. They're lying. They're lying. Just so you know, they're lying. You can look right at them and say, liar. <laughs> It'll be on this price all the way to the end of the year, right? So anyway, the point is, is that when you look at something, you go, man, that's 50% off. I'm going to save 50% by buying that. Let me tell you how to save 100%. Leave the store. Just walk away. He just saved 100%. Whoa, now that's something to get excited about. 100%. Wow, that's big savings. Huge savings. There was a survey done. And in this survey, they they say that 62% of people in North America admit to shopping to cheer themselves up. That's an expensive, expensive cheering up. It's, we call it retail therapy. Has anybody ever heard that word? Yeah. So it's for escape. It's for entertainment. It's for feeling new and clean. It's for monetary significance, but it only lasts a minute. But the temptation is so high in our culture and in our world. It's so high to buy something that you don't need with money that you do not have. And so I want to offer you a prayer. It comes in the form of a verse from Psalm 119, and here's what it says. Cause my heart to bow before your words of wisdom and not to the wealth of this world. Help me turn my eyes away from illusions so that I pursue only that which is true. Amen? Wow, what a great prayer. I need this prayer at times. I need it before I go to the mall. Actually, I saw a little Instagram clip that was so cute. It said, it was, I thought it was romantic at first. It says, when you go to Costco, hold your wife's hand. <laughs> and, then it, and I was like, oh, how sweet, honey. When we go to Costco, let's hold hands. And then I realized what he was doing. Every time she'd stop to look at something, he'd just yank her back. <laughs> he just kept yanking her back. Yes. Lord, before we go to Costco, let's hold hands, sweetie, and pray this. Help me turn my eyes away from illusion so that I pursue only that which is true. Amen. I, in other words, what this verse is saying is I, I, I want to be in that place where I feel like my life is already full in God. I'm full because I'm so rich in the Lord. I don't need stuff to fill some void in there. I'm full in my God. And you know what? If you choose to buy less, you're going to avoid that January crash. You're going to avoid that credit card debt. You're going to avoid that disappointment of the toy you bought for your child and now they're already bored and it's only December 27th. You're going to end up putting stuff in the garbage and you're going to be asking yourself through regret, what was I thinking? We can avoid all that by simply buying less. Now, one of the things that we've done in our family is we've kind of transitioned. Our kids are a bit older now. Um, and we've decided that what we're going to prioritize are our experiences. And so I text my two older kids, one who's uh, married with her own child, and then one who's uh, footloose and fancy free at 20 years old, not paying rent. I need to do something about that. <laughs> and I asked them, I said, come on, give me your favorite memories from when you were kids. And, and what they didn't tell me was about any gifts that we bought them, any time we went to the mall and spent money, not about the great present they got or the new shoes they got or anything like that. This is from my children. And here's what they said. We loved ice cream and fries after church. Amen? You know, they said, we like family dinners where it's so loud you can barely talk. What's well, I'm talking about your richest family memories. They're like, oh, when we were camping. When we went to the lake, we go to the lake, the same place every year. And they treasure it. 
the adventures that we've had together, the, the moments of, of laughter. It, one of them talked about a time we almost died on a boat trip. How can that be a favorite memory? We almost died. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? None of them said anything about a purchase we made. So you don't have to buy the memories. In fact, the memories happen in the margin of experience. And so I want to encourage you to buy less and choose experience with your children. That's where the richness will be. And the third thing is this, give more. Give more. You want to live with one handful in tranquility? Then give. Give more. Decide. And that's why we're talking about this now. Decide what you're going to give before you decide what you're going to spend. And can I encourage you? Make it light and easy. Talk to your spouse. Talk to those who are a part of the financial picture with you. Talk to yourself if that's the way it works and decide what you're going to give before you decide what you're going to spend. In fact, here's the encouragement from Scripture, 1 Timothy 6. It says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. It's all from God. It's all a blessing. We can enjoy it, amen? I want you to enjoy your life. I want you to enjoy the things that God has given you. But some of you are saying, as soon as I say who's rich, you think of someone else, not of yourself. Because we can always look somewhere else and say, I'm not the rich one, they are. But I want you to know, if you drove here in a car, you're rich. If you can have three meals a day, by choice, then you're rich. Do you understand that we are in the top 7% of the wealthiest people in the world simply by living in this country? And so, friends, this verse is for us. Don't put your hope in your wealth. Don't put your hope in your stuff. Put it in God. Hope in God who richly blesses, richly provides everything we need. And then the verse goes on to a command. And and. Paul is talking to young Timothy, the pastor of this church. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. It's about giving, friends. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And this little end of the verse, life that is truly life, takes me all the way back to where we started. Jesus says, come to me. I want it to be light and easy. I want it to be a blessing. This verse doesn't say command them to buy more, to hoard it all, to click buy now on Amazon. It doesn't say that. It says do good, be rich in good deeds, and give, be willing to share. And you know, I, one of the things that I, I'd like to draw us into as we close up today is I want you to think about what stories in your life get you emotional. And here's what I've learned is that you don't get emotions about getting stories, about getting. I, I, I didn't get emotional about the AirPods I got for Christmas last year. <laughs> right? I didn't get emotional about the getting. I finally got my Lulus, right? I didn't get emotional about these things. I, I didn't get emotional about keeping stories, and neither will you. Whew, I almost gave that away, but I'm so glad I kept it. We don't get emotional about the, the, you know, I could have given some money, but I kept it. I could have given money to that group that was eradicating biblical illiteracy in Latin America, but I'm so glad I kept the money for myself. Whoo! Wow, that's good. I'm so glad I didn't give that second refrigerator that's in our garage to that single mom. I'm so glad I kept it. I need a place for my Costco food, right? <laughs> right? Uh, those aren't the stories that we get emotional. But friends, we get emotional about giving stories. We get emotional about seeing a church that didn't exist in a jungle on the border of Myanmar that we got to plant because we gave. Yeah? Those are the things that touch our hearts. The time we get involved, the time it costs us something, the time we were sacrificial and it burns in our hearts because we're making a difference. We're making a difference and that's why we're here. And so it's those things that are really worth doing. Those are the things that we get emotional about. And listen, with Kingdom Builders, with Heart for the House, by the way, we're up over $400,000 for our daycare. So little precious ones can be there hopefully next month. We're 300,000 away. We're gonna do it. I know we are. 
because we're understanding how powerful it is to give, and it's heaven. Think about it. What stories are we going to tell in heaven? It's the giving stories. It's about a God who gave. It's about people who followed Christ's example and gave. Those are the good deeds we're going to see displayed in heaven. Those are going to be emblematic of crowns on heads and joy on faces. Friends, heaven is about giving stories. And that's what we're called to. So let me remind you once again, the world isn't your home. And the stuff we accumulate on this earth, it's meaningless unless we use it to bless others. Jesus wants you to be light and easy. And this is how we can do that. Let's let go of our stuff. Pray with me for just a moment. Lord, I just, I just thank you so much for your goodness and graciousness to us. Lord, we are surrounded by blessing. And as we walk into Christmas, Lord, we reflect together on how this year could look a little different. It could be full of joy and full of good emotion as we become people who, who throw things out and declutter our lives, de-own our lives, and buy less and give more. Lord, what a wonderful pathway for us this Christmas. God, I ask that you'd show us how to keep it light and easy, to take your yoke, to learn from you. To, to, Lord, in order to take from you, we've got we've to put something down. And so, Lord, one handful is better. Because with one handful, then we have a free hand to help. We have a free hand to give. We have a free hand to encourage. We have a free hand to praise. And so, God, we pray that you would burn it in our hearts, that we would truly understand that it's better to have one handful with tranquility. And God, I pray that you would allow us to make a resolution together today that we're never gonna let the stuff we have keep us from living the life we want to live. And so Jesus, we come to you. Thank you that your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. And may this Christmas be marked by light and easy in Jesus' wonderful name. And as we just continue to pray for just a moment, you know, one of the verses we read talks about how that pursuit can be like chasing after the wind. I just sense that there's someone here today, as we just continue to pray for one more minute, there's someone here today who is saying, my whole life has been a chasing after the wind. And I want to tell you the most significant thing you could do this Christmas is to give. And that what you would give is your life to Jesus. That's the most significant thing you could ever do. And in giving your life to Jesus, you now are beginning to understand a pathway first to a light and easy burden and to a hopeful existence in eternity. Jesus says, come to me. I want to give you rest but you've got to come to him. Bring your life to him. The Bible says that when we call in his name, we can be saved. The Bible says when we confess our sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And so if you're here today and you don't have a living relationship with Jesus, listen, you can, you can pray this prayer with me. Jesus, forgive me. I recognize that my past has been a chasing after the wind. I've pursued what I thought was best and I've missed you that which is of greatest value. And so I now choose you. I now come to you. Give me rest. Forgive me. Cover me with your goodness. And show me how to sit beside you, working with you, that I might experience a light yoke and an easy burden. I want to learn. So take my life, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you stand with me for just a moment? And uh, I just want to give you permission to rehearse this little phrase with those who are important to you, with your friends, with your roommates, with your family members. Say, we're going to make Christmas light and easy. We're going to let Jesus help us make Christmas light and easy. You can just say that. Light and easy. Let's keep it light and easy. 
Life can be heavy. Life can be challenging, but we're going to keep it light and easy. Amen? Amen. Be blessed, church. We love you. Let's sing together.